right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for sticking around at Slush. Um, excited to be here and talk to you about space. Um, when many people think about space, they think of the Hubble telescope, or they think of traveling at warp speed through the alpha quadrant of the Milky Way galaxy. But I'm here today on this stage because space is projected to be a multi-trillion dollar industry very soon, and so people are starting to think about quite different things when we talk about space. Um, so today I just want to talk about kind of the past decade, um, where, where the industry has kind of been and where we're going, uh, what the future looks like for space, and introduce some of my colleagues who are going to be talking to you about uh, what they're working on as well. Uh, so the, the world has been using space for the past almost 70 years uh, for things like national security, science and research and development, and a few commercial applications like um, DISH TV and satellite radio. And this has been the state of things. Um, satellites have looked like this. Um, they're gigantic. They've cost a couple billion dollars. Um, space has just been fundamentally very hard, um, a hard place to take advantage of um, across industries. And it really wasn't utilized unless you were a nation state or a Fortune 500 company with hundreds of billions of dollars to burn through. And space has been hard for three main reasons. Um, the first is launch. It's very expensive. Um, it's been coming down. You'll hear more about that after me. Um, the costs have been coming down, but it still is a very hard problem to solve. Um, electronics to send into orbit have been very costly and bulky. And um, the third main reason space is hard is there are some critical systems that you need to put on board a satellite, like power systems and propulsion, uh, that have just been very challenging to, to use um, if you are maybe budget constrained or um, not on the cutting edge of, of technology. And so we've carried on using space like this, um, spending you know, multi-billions of dollars to launch satellites, and have been launching in the past about 30 of these big satellites per year. Uh, now satellites are starting to look more like this. If you heard Will Marshall's talk yesterday, uh, his company Planet has you know, hundreds of, of satellites, a little bit larger than this one on orbit. Um, but we've been working really hard in the industry to solve these challenges. Um, so, you know, some are solved, we're on the way to solving others. And now we're launching hundreds of satellites per year um, as, as a species a, a, across the globe. Um, the satellite, the number of launches per year is actually following, almost following Moore's law. Uh, so I mentioned 30 satellites per year until about 20 years ago, and that number's been increasing. And, and imminently, uh, we're projected to, to start launching tens of thousands satellites per year. Uh, so this is, this is not the first time people have tried to launch smaller satellites to save on the costs. This is kind of the, the third time, really. Um, the, the first time small satellites were launched, actually, the, the very first satellite, Sputnik, was technically a small satellite. So in 1957, um, Sputnik weighed, I think, 84 kilograms. That's technically a small satellite. And then they got much bigger, the size of a, a school bus. Um, and then in the 90s, um, if you have an MBA, you might have studied some of these cases in business school. Uh, some companies raised a, a ton of money uh, to try to use small satellites to provide um, internet and cell service to people across the globe, and they failed pretty spectacularly. And so this, you know, the past decade or so represents the third time uh, space agencies and, and commercial companies are trying to launch small satellites. And I think it's very different this time. Um, it's going to stick. You know, obviously, I, I believe that. I work in the industry. Um, but it's kind of the perfect storm of, of factors that we have working in our favor this time. So there's actually demand uh, for the services that satellites provide. People care about the internet now and want to be connected to it. Um, because of improved algorithms and computing power, we can actually process and make sense of a lot of the data that satellites are able to beam down, so images of the Earth and various other signals. 
uh, 20 years ago, a lot of that uh, data would have just sat there and we wouldn't really have known how to infer useful conclusions from it. Uh, Moore's law has meant that now you can pack very tiny, capable electronics into these small form factors. Um, so satellites this size or the size of a shoebox can have very capable cameras and radios and computers, and that wasn't the case. It, I'm, everybody knows Moore's Law. It's been getting better and better. Um, we can fit more useful things into satellites of this size today than ever before. And then the other kind of perfect storm factor is these billionaire cowboys that wanted to start launching rockets into space, um, what they actually ended up doing was creating competition for some of the bigger governments and defense contractors that were maybe a little bit sluggish and not very efficient in how they spent their money. So um, when these private companies came in and introduced this competition, costs started coming down because they had to, and um, venture capital was kind of quick to follow that. So the result of this this perfect storm, as they called it, is that the bar to access space has been lowered tremendously. So you don't have to be a nation state or a you know, Fortune 500 company willing to spend hundreds of billions of dollars. You can be a hobbyist in your garage um, or a high school student and you can launch a satellite. It's, it's the democratization of space and it's doing some quite magical things for, for the world. Um, perhaps like less crappy internet on flights um, is one application, or um, tracking crop yields. Uh, banks can look at new housing developments to price futures. Um, and of course, there are also a lot of more kind of world positive changes happening as well because of satellites. Um, using satellite imagery, we can better predict and respond to natural disasters. Um, I have my favorite example that I mentioned yesterday, so apologies if you heard that already, but a uh, mobile breast cancer clinic uh, would perform exams and then they would, up, they would put the results on USB drives and then every 90 days they would take those and drop them off at a doctor's office for a doctor to analyze the results and 90 days is a long time um, for some of these folks. And uh, more recently, they signed a contract with a satellite provider and they upload the results of the exams in real time and doctors have access to them and patients get the care they need um, in a much more timely manner. And perhaps the biggest impact that we'll see and that I'm excited about is um, satellites providing internet and connecting everyone on the globe to it and to one another, to things like microfinancing platforms, um, to doctors, to schools. I, I'm just very excited for that day. I think it's going to totally change the, the world and the economy as we know it today. Uh, but of course, like everything in life, um, this is all not without its challenges. Um, so I'll talk about a few of those and then my colleagues that will be on after me um, are working to address some of these as well. So uh, what is space debris? Um, so many of these satellites are being launched to low Earth orbit, which is anything below about 2,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And actually in that belt, there's this already a significant amount of debris that exists there, um, man-made pieces of material. Uh, and so when you're launching to that orbit, you actually have to be conscious of that. These pieces of metal might be very tiny, but they're traveling at about the speed of a bullet. Um, and so they can seriously impact a satellite. Uh, satellites that explode at the end of their lifetime can create tens of thousands of pieces of debris. So this is something people are working um, actively to address and is kind of a big issue in the industry right now. Uh, I mentioned that launch has been very hard. Um, it's hard largely because of the low volumes. If you're trying to stand up a manufacturing line to build six rockets per year, um, that's not very effective and it's going to be very expensive. So in order to bring those costs down, we need many more launches. In order to have many more launches, we need the cost to come down. And we've been a little stuck in this circular problem um, for a while. And um, Jim, who's on after me, will, will talk about some more of that. Um, clouds, if you've looked outside today and imagined trying to take a picture uh, of the Earth uh, perhaps of Finland uh, from a satellite, all you would see is a big white uh, cloud. 
Um, it's quite lovely outside, though, my first time seeing snow this season, um, so that's wonderful. Um, so, uh, you know, a way around this, something that um, Rafael, one of my other space colleagues, will be talking about is called synthetic aperture radar. So instead of using traditional optical imaging, they use radio frequency to essentially create a, a kind of composite image of, of the Earth and see through clouds. Um, and one last challenge that's near and dear to my heart is propulsion. So today, broadly speaking, small satellites are launched into orbit and are left without a means to maneuver themselves. Um, they can't transfer orbits, they can't dodge this debris that I mentioned, they can't get themselves into the right, right orbital slot. Uh, and so that's what, what my team works on. So we founded um, Axion Systems to solve this problem, and we spun out of MIT. Um, and we're, we're developing this uh, engine that uses electrical energy to produce thrust. And the engines are small, but they're also modular and scalable. So back home in Boston, half of my team of engineers is working on the product. So we have three um, propulsion systems that we're delivering early next year that will fly um, on missions. And the other half of the team is working on improving the performance so that not only can we address this small satellite kind of revolution that's happening, but um, we can go beyond that and start transporting humans to Mars and other space stations and performing interplanetary missions as well. So the, the outlook for space is quite exciting. This is a very, um, there's a lot of action going on right now, a very exciting time in the industry. Um, and it's fueled by more money and new technologies, and so I'll touch on just a few of those. And one is um, machine learning or you know, AI, neural networks, lots of buzzwords there. Um, and the same way that machine learning is transforming other industries, it's helping us in the space industry as well to make sense, like I mentioned, of some of this data that we're collecting about the planet, um, allowing us to make you know, educated um, guesses about maybe how many cars are parked in a Walmart parking lot, how does that translate into um, you know, shopping for different seasons and so on. Um, so machine learning, I think we're just seeing the tip of, of that iceberg. It will be a very exciting um, technology coming into space as well. Um, venture capital, I think it's a, a fantastic time to be a startup in the space space. Um, in the U.S. at least, in the past year, the amount of money invested in the industry went up significantly. The amount of deals went down, um, so money is being kind of consolidated in some of the later growth stages. But I think maybe here and in other places, we're a little bit earlier, so there is a bit more seed funding to be had. Um, another trend I'm watching is freight transport. So when you're shipping packages, uh, time basically equals money. And if you can send a package via rocket, um, that can translate into something like 120,000% um, a, a decrease in cost. Uh, and you know, if that number doesn't make your eyes light up, um, you know, I don't know what would. Uh, but f for me and my company, what you know, really gets me excited is to be on the stage having a conversation about one day taking people to Mars with the technology we're developing and other planets, and to, just, to be having this discussion about maybe receiving a package from Amazon that reached me by rocket. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited, you know, there's never really been a time like this before in history for us. Um, very fortunate, and with that, I'll turn it over to some of my colleagues. So thank you.